Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sierra Juliang, and I'm part of the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, I would like to welcome you to our final webinar in a four-part series on youth opioids and ESPERT. Um, today, we're going to be discussing the final portion of ESPERT referral to treatment. I'd just like to take a few moments to thank our funders, California Youth Opioid Response, um, for supporting this project. A few housekeeping items. Um, this webinar is being recorded. If um, you have not already, here's the call-in number and the access code to access the audio. Um, the recording and slides will be posted on the website by the end of this week um, on our website, which is schoolhealthcenters.org. There will also be additional expert resources. As I mentioned, this is our final webinar in a four-part series. We had a webinar on screening and brief intervention. Um, the resources from those webinars are on our website. And today also we'll be releasing two quick guides, which I'll discuss more at the end, um, but one will be on referral to treatment and one will be on um, opioid use disorders and use. And also, if you have any questions, just to um, familiarize you with WebEx, you can go ahead and type them into the chat box on the side. Uh, we'll be answering questions throughout the presentation, so feel free to enter questions as they come up. Just a little bit of information about the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, we're a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth um, by advancing health services in schools. Our work is based, is based on two basic concepts. Healthcare should be accessible and where kids are, and schools should have the services needed to ensure that core health is not a barrier to learning. We do this through a variety of ways, capacity building, technical assistance, um, workshops and webinars like today. And uh, there is the link to our website where you can find the recording uh, as well as the slides after, after today's presentation. Just a quick note on our membership. If you would like to be, um, become a member, you would get exclusive benefits. So that would include things like conference registration discount, this year's conference has been moved to a virtual platform, so please keep a lookout in our newsletter for updates. Um, we have member-only tools and resources, technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs, and there's the link to sign up um, if you are interested in becoming a member. And without further ado, I would like to present today's speaker, Dr. Amy Mullen. Um, she is an associate professor at UC Davis. She has, a, she has a dual appointment in the Department of Emergency Medicine and Psychiatry. Dr. Mullen is the Behavioral Health Director for the Emergency Department at UC Davis. She completed a fellowship in quality, safety, and comparative effectiveness research through the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality with a focus on acute care for patients with behavioral health disorders. She's a co-investigator with the California Bridge Project that provides a link for patients with opiate use disorder to recovery. Dr. Mullen is the immediate past president of the California chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians. And I'm going to pass it over to her. Thank you, everyone. I'm excited to be with you today. Um, and we're going to be focusing on treatment, which is, as you mentioned, the final portion of this, but I'm hoping that what you will take from today it is actually one of the key pieces in the SBIRT, and that is referral to treatment, and we're going to focus today on treatment. I would love to hear from you, so if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A section. I'm happy to ask them as we go through it, and I will pause at a couple points during the presentation to answer your questions, so please don't be shy and go ahead and stop me at any moment and put those questions in. So we're going to talk about three pieces today. We're going to focus on the medical model of addiction with a focus on adolescents because that is our target population. We're going to talk about 
different treatment options for opiate use disorder, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how medications actually work to treat addiction. So I apologize in advance because we are going to talk about um, we're going to talk about some neurobiology. We're going to talk about some receptors. So we're going to be a little bit nerdy here. Um, so please feel free to ask questions, but I really just couldn't help myself. So please bear with me. Okay. I start every talk with this because I think it is really key to everything that we do when we talk about addiction. Addiction is not a moral failing. It is a chronic disease and it requires medical treatment. And I think this is really the key piece for us to think about and to focus on um, because a lot of what has gone on in terms of addiction and caring for individuals with use disorders is that we think of it as a disease of willpower and we think of this as something that the individual really should just make better decisions. But I'm hoping that by the end of this, you will change how you think about substance use disorders and really see this as a chronic illness, but even more than that, a treatable illness, because I really want to focus on this being something that we can treat and that addiction is something that we can solve. And hopefully from this, you'll change your perspective and really push you to intervene, intervene early, and to get folks into treatment as early as possible so that we can really intervene and change their trajectory, because I think we have a real opportunity here. All right, um, so here we go. We're going to talk about the medical model of addiction, and we're going to focus on adolescence. Please, again, stop me at any moment. Put your questions in. I would love to answer them. Okay, so here we have the teenage brain. Um, and there's a couple pieces that I want to draw your attention to. Um, I know that we are all focused on the chore particle, which is down in the bottom in the occipital lobe. Um, but what we're going to focus on today is addiction. And you can see here the addiction is addiction. They have here addiction to Facebook and your cell phone, which we know is very common in teenage years. But if you look at this, sort of puzzle piece. Um, this is actually anatomically correct. I'm kidding. But this little puzzle piece kind of correlates to something that we call the nucleus accumbens. And this is the part of the brain that is really thought to modulate addiction. It's very important in addiction because this is the part of the brain that is often where we have experiences as positive or negative. So this is actually, um, they were nice and they put this little puzzle piece, hopefully you can all tell where it is, this is the nucleus accumbens, but you'll also notice that this is sort of deep within the midbrain, um, and the midbrain is where we have sort of our, they, they call it the, the initial brain, this is where you have your reptilian sort of um, impulses of I want, you know, this looks good, I want it, I want cake, I'm going to eat it now versus the frontal lobe, which we call the love lobe here in the teenage brain, is really the stop piece, where your midbrain will say, I'm going to eat all this cake, I'm going to grab it, and I'm going to stick it in my face, and that's what you do when you are a two. Your frontal lobe, as it develops, it says, hey, you know, that's not a really good idea, that's not what we do, this is sort of not polite company, we eat things quietly, we, we should really eat our vegetables, those are better for us. So the frontal lobe is sort of the stop piece, and the midbrain says, hey, I want it, I want it, I want it, and the frontal lobe says, hey, slow down, that's not really a good idea. And what we know about brain development is your frontal lobe really doesn't fully develop until around 26. Um, and so this really explains a lot about the adolescent early adult period, because what we know from brain development is you really can't make these good decisions until age 26. And so I often think back to, um, you know, your adolescent young adult patients, if you feel like they're not making those best decisions, that's just where they are in their developmental stage. And we all kind of know that. And what we've learned from brain development really reinforces that. So. Here we kind of have the same thing, and you can see there's the nucleus accumbens, and what the nucleus accumbens does is this is 
tagged by dopamine. And what it likes and what the brain really likes are experiences that are better than expected. And so when you have an experience and this, you know, you'll expect a certain amount of um, positive reinforcement. And if that experience is better than you expected, it gets tagged in the nucleus accumbens as something good. Um, and then the nucleus accumbens will say, hey, we had that experience. We really liked it. We're going to tag that. We're going to remember that that was something positive, and we're going to want to do that again. And then it will feed that up to the frontal lobe, and the frontal lobe will say, ah, you know, based on our circumstances, I don't know if it's really the right plan for us at this moment. And the frontal lobe is really the stop switch. The midbrain says, I want it, and the frontal lobe says, maybe not today. Maybe this is not a good decision. So that's kind of the, the breaks. Um, and so what happens with substance use disorders is they really produce a very powerful dopamine response in the nucleus accumbens. And so the nucleus accumbens will then tag that experience as really, really positive, much better than expected. So it'll tag that um, experience with the substances, a really positive experience, and it can overpower our frontal lobe. And so when it gets tagged with the strength that it often does with a really height of a dopamine response, it will actually derail um, that stop switch from the frontal lobe. And so that is how you start to develop the patterns that we see in addiction is the nucleus accumbens and that midbrain takes over the frontal lobe. And so that stop switch where we have those thoughtful processes about what we want to do and forward planning and thinking, they get completely overridden by the nucleus accumbens, which is telling us we want to reproduce that positive experience. Okay, so here is the challenge for adolescents. Because the nucleus accumbens, which is that place where we're able to tag experiences as positive or negative, that's is fully developed by 14. And remember, frontal lobe development happens around 26. And so what we see often in that adolescent period is that mismatch between our go switch in the nucleus accumbens and the breaks in the frontal lobe. And so people often describe this period of development as someone who is driving a car where the brakes aren't fully developed. Um, and so that's where we often get some of the risk-taking behavior that we see in adolescents. Um, and this is thought to be partially responsible for risk-taking behavior and why adolescents tend to be a very vulnerable period in terms of developing substance use disorders. And I can pause here because I've gone through a lot of brain development and I'm curious if there are any questions. If you have, go ahead and put them in the chat box or go ahead and add them to the Q&A section. Okay, I'm going to keep plowing ahead, um, but please feel free to back up and ask any questions if you have them. So this is actually um, looks at MRI data on brain development, and what you can see here is activity in the nucleus accumbens really peaks here in the adolescent period. In this, um, in this is in response to different stimuli. So you see a small stimuli, a medium stimuli, and a large stimulus. These are positive responses to dopamine. And what you will see is you get a much bigger response during that adolescent period to a positive reward response. So that actually gets tagged by the nucleus accumbens as a greater positive in the adolescent than either the adult and the child. And that is thought to be due to that mismatch between development of the nucleus accumbens and the frontal lobe. So you can kind of see there's that, that mismatch during that adolescent period um, where the nucleus accumbens is really in charge. And this is what we've seen from MRI data. So what we know is because of this mismatch in brain development, adolescents are particularly at risk for substance use disorders. However, what we have also seen is that substance use disorders often be begin in adolescence, but treatment doesn't begin until much later in adulthood. 
So we know from data around patients in treatment, and we know that individuals who are diagnosed with substance use disorders later in life, frequently that began during their adolescent period. So we also have this period where we have a window where we're missing patients. And so what I'm hoping you'll take from this is that we do have an opportunity to reach patients much younger in life when their use disorders are first beginning. So this is based on a survey from SAMHSA that looked at the age of first use versus the age of treatment. So they did this, this is from survey data of patients who are in treatment and they asked them what age they started using and then what age they started treatment. And you can see there's almost a 10 year gap and that there's in most individuals, their average first use was 17 years and their average age of first treatment was at around 26.7 years. And so there's a mismatch between when individuals start versus when we actually are able to scoop them up into treatment. And so I think we have a huge opportunity in, to start closing that gap between the onset of use and treatment, because by the time we're picking up individuals into the treatment space, we've already let this illness go on for almost a decade. Any questions here? Again, go ahead, feel free to type it into the chat or in the Q&A section. Okay, this is a, another survey that shows around 10% of 12 to 17 year olds who need substance use treatment are actually receiving services. Um, and this is also a survey from SAMHSA. So we know that we have a huge untreated population that we're gonna try and reach. Um, and this is another data from SAMHSA that basically shows the age of initiation. This is from survey data that shows when the patient first started using, and you can see there's that spike between 15 to 17. And then what I thought was interesting is the age of initiation of folks who are 25 and older is actually pretty, uh, that's the lowest bucket. Um, and this is, you know, frontal lobe development. And so individuals beyond 26, the frontal lobe is really in charge. It's no longer the nucleus accumbens. Um, so I do think that it is really interesting how this kind of correlates with brain development. Okay, I think this is really important and this is something that I think has really changed a lot of how I think about how we are delivering care to individuals with use disorders. And this was a survey of individuals who are in treatment and they looked at the number of folks who were in treatment in different settings. And overwhelmingly, the highest number of individuals were in treatment through the juvenile justice system. So this is between ages 12 to 17. And so what this tells us is that we are providing treatment through the justice system. Um, and this is, I think, really important because, as we know, by the time someone is involved in the justice system, we've kind of already gotten some of the consequences of their use disorder. And a lot fewer individuals are being engaged in treatment through community organizations or their treatment providers. I thought this was really remarkable that their um, treatment providers were down here at the lower end of this spectrum. So here we are back to our screening brief intervention and referral to treatment. And we have, there's been a lot of data around the efficacy of SBIRT in getting individuals into treatment. There have been several studies looking at school-based um, school SBIRT that has shown really good efficacy in getting adolescents into treatment. And so just to review what this is, is your screening your brief intervention, which is some motivational interviewing and referral to treatment. And I think it's that referral to treatment, which is a really key piece because that is closing of the loop. And we have learned that it is really important to do that warm handoff and the transition into treatment is a really vulnerable time for patients um, 
because they're often making large changes when they're entering the treatment space. There's a lot of fear and anxiety around entering treatment. And so that is a period where we frequently will lose individuals when we're making that transition into stable treatment. So I think it is really important that we are all um, supporting individuals as much as we can as they make that transition into treatment. Okay, I do see that I have a question here that says, do we know anything about when use becomes a problem in terms of age? And I think this is really an important question. We don't know, I think there's a lot that we don't know on when use transitions from recreational to a substance use disorder. We do know that adolescents are at higher risk for developing use disorders later in life. But certainly there is a group of adolescents who we can call them experimenters who have exposure to different substances and, no, and do not go on to develop substance use disorders later in life. And I don't think that we have fully elucidated who is individually at risk for developing that substance use disorder later in life. We do know some of the triggers, um, certainly Adolescents who have and are experiencing trauma in their life um, are at higher risk to develop use disorders, and we do believe that genetics plays a role. But there are individuals who are exposed to different substances during that crucial adolescent period who do not go on to develop substance use disorders. And so I think that is where it is difficult to tease out. Um, but, I, but there is a large subset of, they, of adolescents who do go on to develop substance use disorders, and I think we're definitely missing that window. So great question. Please feel free to go ahead and ask questions. I'm gonna transition here to talk about different treatment options for opiate use disorder. And one of the things that I think is really crucial to know is that Particularly for opiate use disorder, we have wonderful treatments. We have treatments that are highly effective for opiate use disorder, more than some of the other substances. So just to know that these treatment options are out there and available to your patients and have been used in adolescents and young adults as well as adult patients. Unfortunately, frequently what happens is we encounter someone with a substance use disorder, particularly an adolescent or young adult, and our plan is really to hope for the best in that we really do not want this individual to have a substance use disorder. And so what we'd like to do is just hope that they're in the bucket of individuals that will not go on to develop a substance use disorder. And we really try to hold on and think that this person is someone we just really want to hope for the best, as opposed to digging in and realizing that this is an important opportunity to get someone into treatment. So I'm going to go through and walk through some of the different treatment options, and then later I'm going to really focus in on medications and focus in on how medications work for use disorders. Um, but I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions around the medical model of addiction and, and how the neurobiology is different in adolescents. This is maybe something that you all already know because I'm not getting any questions, but please feel free. Okay, we're going to go ahead and blaze forward. Cognitive behavioral therapy is something we're all familiar with. This is frequently used for adolescents and young adults, and it focuses on developing alternative coping mechanisms. And essentially what they'll often use is peer support, um, and you use that positive experience of developing alternative coping mechanisms and peer support to tag those mechanisms as a positive experience in that nucleus accumbens. And what you would like to do is rewire the brain to say, hey, I would like to have these alternative coping mechanisms, these alternative therapies, rather than tagging that substance as positive. So you try to rewire the brain and teach the nucleus accumbens that there are other things that you want to do that are positive experiences. 
Um, this is shown to have less efficacy with adolescents with opiate use disorder than alcohol and marijuana. There's been a lot more evidence in terms of the efficacy of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, in marijuana than in opiate use disorder. However, it is commonly used as a treatment modality. The other one that I think is very interesting is called contingency management. And what this does is it leverages the random reward response that the brain really likes. So this is essentially what the brain likes and what is often, remember the nucleus accumbens will tag something as positive, particularly if it is better than expected. So in, it's essentially gambling. So if you put something out there and say, I don't know what kind of reward I get and I, I'm randomly rewarded, then that experience is tagged by the brain as better than expected and it has a more positive response. And so what contingency management is it leverages how the brain reacts to that random reward response. And it uses that to link desired behavior with that dopamine release to achieve treatment goals. So practically what happens is if someone is engaged in treatment or is participating in what our desired behaviors are, participating in cognitive behavioral therapy or decreasing their use, then they can apply for a random reward. And so a lot of the times this is, you know, spinning a wheel to see what your reward is or reaching into a hat to pull out and figure out what your reward is. Frequently they are small to large rewards, can be cash, can be prizes, um, but because it is random reinforcement, it frequently is, works to tag that as better than expected. And that is contingency management. It has shown efficacy in most substance use disorders with different substances and shown particular efficacy in adolescents because of their susceptibility to the nucleus accumbens. So this actually is something that has shown to work very well for our adolescent population. Any questions on contingency management? I think it is a technique that we probably don't use often enough. Okay, so we're gonna blaze on and talk specifically about medications and how medications work to treat addiction, particularly for opiate use disorder. So currently there are um, different medications and three different categories of medications that are approved for the treatment of opiate use disorder. This is often called MAT, which is Medication Assisted Treatment, or MOUD, which is Medications for Opiate Use Disorder. And the reason that we have these two different not names is because medications can be used as actual treatment rather than as an adjuvant for treatment. So we've actually seen that some individuals do great with just medications. And the way this is analogous is for the treatment for diabetes, that we consider insulin treatment for diabetes. Certainly it is desirable if individuals who have type 2 diabetes um, also participate in diet and exercise programs, but insulin is the treatment for diabetes. Similarly, these medications are the treatment for opiate use disorder. And they fall into three categories. One is full agonist, and that is something like methadone treatment. A partial agonist, and that is buprenorphine or suboxone. An antagonist, which is naltrexone or commonly referred to as Narcan or naloxone. So essentially the way this works is the mu receptor is the receptor on the brain that opiates bind to. And a full agonist has a full binding effect of the opiate mu receptor, and so you get full dopamine release. So our full agonist will bind to the receptor, fully activate it, and it will give you that full dopamine release that the nucleus accumbens like so much, and it gets tagged as a really positive experience. Versus, so something like a full antagonist is something like naloxone. This is essentially where you have an unbound receptor 
and you get no effect on the new receptor and no response no dopamine response. So often what you'll have is withdrawal pain or withdrawal symptoms as a full agonist is pulled off of that receptor. This is how naloxone works, which is Narcan or naltrexone. When you have a overdose and someone has overdosed on opiates and you have excessive activation of that mu receptor, another drug like naloxone will come in, bind to that receptor, but not activate the receptor and you will remove the opiates. And so you will remove all of those um, dopamine response and we'll often see the symptoms of withdrawal in those cases. Versus a partial agonist, and this is something like buprenorphine. And what buprenorphine does is it will bind to that opiate mu receptor and partially activate it. And so what we will get is some response to the new receptor and we will get some dopamine release. And what that will do is that will prevent those full withdrawal symptoms that we will get with the antagonist and it will ease the symptoms of withdrawal. One of the nice parts about buprenorphine from a therapeutic perspective is that it binds very tightly to the mu receptor. So if a opiate, a full agonist is bound to that receptor and the person is then exposed to buprenorphine, because buprenorphine has a higher affinity to the mu receptor, it will actually knock off the full agonist, bind the receptor and block a full opiate from binding to the receptor. So essentially buprenorphine acts as both an antagonist and an agonist. Basically what this means is if a patient has taken buprenorphine, then uses heroin on top of buprenorphine, if they've given, been given enough buprenorphine and buprenorphine has blocked all of those receptors, that individual will have no response to the heroin because the full agonist will have nothing to bind because all of the receptors will be bound up by buprenorphine. So it's very useful from a therapeutic perspective. And again, with that partial agonist, because it does not fully activate the receptor, we do not see the same effects that we do from a full agonist. So we do not see the same euphoria and respiratory depression that you do with the full agonist. So it works very well to treat cravings and works very well to treat the physiologic symptoms of withdrawal without having the same effect as a full agonist. Um, versus again, the full antagonist, this is something like naloxone or Narcan, and the way that that will work is that if an individual has a full agonist, heroin, um, methadone, and is given naloxone, then that will kick off the full agonist and you will have that withdrawal pain um, and it will reverse the dopamine signal given by the new receptor. And again, I'm going to pause um, for any questions. I know it's a lot of detail, but I think it is important to understand the difference between the different therapies for opiates um, and to understand how they're acting on the brain. Because a lot of times I think we will think in terms of we are just replacing one drug with another. And to some extent, what we're trying to do is take advantage of how those brains are, those receptors are acting in the brain. And so giving a drug like buprenorphine, which is a full agonist, is actually treating the symptoms of withdrawal and helping the nucleus accumbens to recover. Because what will happen is in the substance use disorder, remember that nucleus accumbens gets very used to having the high dopamine release um, that it does, that it will get from exposure to a full agonist, it will have very, very high dopamine levels, and those will then override the frontal lobe. When, those, when the high dopamine levels are gone, the nucleus accumbens will 
tell the brain, we need more of that, we need more of that, we need more of that, and it will override the frontal lobe because of the height of the dopamine response. And then what happens with buprenorphine, because it is a partial agonist, it allows the nucleus accumbens to feel like it is getting exposed to the, to the dopamine that it wants, it can quiet down, and the frontal lobe can take back control. And so because we're able to quiet those symptoms of craving and withdrawal, the nucleus accumbens is satisfied that it has some dopamine, it is no longer driving the ship, and the frontal lobe gets to start taking over. And really what you need to engage in some of the other treatment modalities like cognitive behavioral therapy and contingency management is you really need to be able to work with the frontal lobe. And so it works very well to allow the frontal lobe to take back control and the individual to start to engage in their own recovery. And physiologically, we have seen that this works. We have seen that medications for opiate use disorder decrease mortality. And this is really our goal for everyone is that we are decreasing mortality. And so this is basically a study that looks at the percentage of individuals who are in treatment versus out of treatment. And we will see higher death rates for individuals who are out of treatment than in treatment. And that is true for both treatment with methadone, which is a full agonist, and buprenorphine, which is the partial agonist. So what about adolescents? Um, there have been several randomized controlled trials of individuals who are 12 to 17 years old being treated with buprenorphine for opiate use disorder. They look at individuals who have a moderate to severe opiate use disorder, and we have seen the adolescents will show decreased use and then longer retention in treatment with buprenorphine. And these were studies that looked at treatment with cognitive behavioral therapy or contingency management versus cognitive behavioral therapy and buprenorphine. And we will we are see functionally what we know is true in the brain that individuals who have medications to help are better able to engage in treatment. Any questions here? Okay. Um, so a lot of questions are about buprenorphine. Some of the things that make it advantageous for our population is that it can be prescribed by a primary care provider as an outpatient. So full agonist treatment, a lot of you are probably more familiar with methadone treatments and methadone clinics. Methadone is, needs to be given usually on a daily basis, and these are the methadone clinics where individuals will have to go every day to get their dose of methadone. This can be challenging in terms of school attendance if you have to attend a clinic appointment on a daily basis versus buprenorphine, which can be prescribed and allows individuals to space out their clinic appointments and it's easier to then resume a regular schedule, which is important in terms of recovery. It is important, particularly for adolescents, to be able to re-engage in their everyday life. Um, buprenorphine can be prescribed by a primary care provider or a pediatrician who has an X waiver. An X waiver is a special license that is attached to a DEA. So after a prescriber takes an X an eight hour course to get an X waiver, they can prescribe buprenorphine. They do not need to be attached to a methadone clinic to prescribe buprenorphine, but they do need to have a, taken the eight hour course to get the X waiver. There is a lower abuse potential with buprenorphine. Frequently um, what is prescribed is Suboxone, and Suboxone is a combination of buprenorphine and naloxone. Naloxone, remember, is the full antagonist like Narcan, and what happens in those combination prescriptions is the naloxone is an abuse deterrent. So if the medication was to be crushed and injected, as soon as it is crushed, the naloxone becomes the active ingredient. And so if an individual took Suboxone, crushed it, and injected it, essentially the active piece would be the naloxone. So they would not get any effect from that medication if they tried to 
it's an abuse deterrent. Um, also, again, remember the partial agonist does not have the same effects on the brain as a full agonist, so we don't see the same euphoria or respiratory depression that we see with a full agonist. And again, studies looking at um, buprenorphine and when it is diverted, so when it is purchased on the street or used without a prescription, is it is most frequently used for its intended purpose in that people use buprenorphine without a prescription because they would like to be in treatment or they do not want to with experience withdrawal symptoms. They want to be able to um, rejoin their regular life without experiencing those withdrawal symptoms. So we know that it has lower abuse potential. Questions here? Amy, we had a question come in. Um, after starting um, someone on that, will they always be on the medication? Great question. And essentially, the answer depends on the individual. We do know that um, in randomized control trials of shorter durations, that individuals who are in treatment with buprenorphine longer do better, particularly um, the recommended minimum is at least two years because individuals who have shorter treatment courses have higher rates of relapse and overdose. And so most places recommend at least two years of buprenorphine treatment. And then there are some individuals who just simply do better with a lower dose of buprenorphine. And the way that we think about this is that opiate use disorder can be a chronic illness and it may require chronic treatment. There are patients who um, recover to the point where they no longer need medications, daily medications to control their disorder and can discontinue treatment with buprenorphine. Some of those individuals may have different life experiences where they might need to resume treatment with buprenorphine, but it is individualized. So it really, the answer depends, um, but the best evidence comes when that time limit is not restricted, but individualized. But great question. Any other questions? I'll keep going. Okay, and so I'm back to the beginning, and hopefully as we kind of get more into our understanding of the biology of addiction and the biology of how medications work as we start to understand that it is not a moral failing, that functionally what happens is the brain gets rewired, and so when the nucleus accumbens is taken over, the frontal lobe, which is the part that helps us to make those um, reasoned, informed, adult, over 26-year-old decisions, gets completely derailed. And what you will see is some behaviors that we frequently associate, um, those negative behaviors that we will see in terms of manipulation, lying, that are often viewed negatively in terms of someone who has a substance use disorder, those behaviors are a symptom of the disease process, that functionally the nucleus accumbens and the midbrain has taken over and that individual is biologically now unable to act in the way that we would like to see them. And so when you see those behaviors, change how you think of it and think of, hey, this is someone who is really struggling and who has a serious illness and needs treatment. And so it has really helped me to think about where those individuals are and that they are struggling and you see those behaviors that you want to view negatively and kind of think of that as a symptom of a severe disease that needs treatment. And also to know that people can and do recover with treatment and so it really changes how we think about individuals who are struggling is you will see that as someone who is an opportunity, particularly for our adolescents, to really change the trajectory of their life if we change how we think about addiction and offer, offering treatment. And again, I wanted to get back to this piece. Um, 
and to think about the other part of how we view addiction and that substance use disorders are really the only medical condition that are a crime. And that it is really a challenge to all of us to know that the most common place that we are treating adolescents is in the juvenile justice system. And at that point, the social consequences, they've already engaged with the justice system and all of the downstream consequences of that involvement on their future life. And that really what we need to be doing is intervening much earlier and to think about um, the consequences in terms of their life trajectory of criminalizing what is functionally a medical disorder and to really think about you know how we are approaching this disease um, and that we are really stacking the deck against these young adults and adolescents by engaging the justice system when really what we need to do is engage folks in treatment much earlier and so i just wanted to put this out to you is when we are engaging adolescents in particularly in treatment through the juvenile justice system we have already failed these individuals and that we've already missed the most crucial window for treatment which is before they've ever um, engaged in the justice system and ideally we can start to recognize and engage individuals and families into treatment before they're involved in the justice system so that we can prevent some of those downstream consequences. So I just wanted to toss that out there because this is something that I think is really important for people who use drugs, um, particularly our adolescent population. And then when we look at the, you know, given where we are today in terms of racial justice and Black Lives Matter and how we are having a greater recognition of how racism plays into the justice system, to think about the role of substance use disorders and how people are engaged in treatment and really to think about what is our role in making sure that we are providing equitable access to treatment rather than the justice system and that individuals we know are more frequently engaged in the justice system if they are people of color than if they're white. And so really starting to think about who we're engaging in treatment and how we can do a better job of outreaching to people who are at risk for involvement in the juvenile justice system. And then this is the last thing that I would like to leave you with. And this is the principle of harm reduction. And what this says is, to meet people where they are, but don't leave them there. And so essentially you reach out to someone to wherever they are, to whatever space they're ready to receive you, and then make whatever steps you can to pull them into recovery. And so this is my last thought that I want to leave you with. Um, and please feel free to add in any questions or to go ahead and contact me later if you would like to. I'm going to pass the ball back over to you, but please feel free to type in any questions if you have them. Um, I'll give people a few moments to type in questions. Um, I actually have a question, Amy. So you mentioned that referral to treatment can sometimes be like intimidating, um, especially for young people. And I was wondering if you had any recommendations in terms of um, what that like what that conversation might look like, or best practices that you've learned or lessons learned um, in in doing that. Yeah, and so I think that this is where the principles of trauma informed care really help us, and that if you try to engage that individual in a very non-stigmatizing way and approach them with, with compassion to understand where they are, um, that that is really the best approach in that we try to normalize addiction and normalize treatment so that I am not in any way approaching that individual as someone um, from a punitive standpoint and that you really want to try to engage that individual like hey i understand that you are struggling with this or particularly for adolescents because sometimes they don't necessarily 
recognize the full consequences because of the delays in frontal lobe to make it real for them um, and to address some of the consequences that they are feeling and to reach out to them as saying, we can help you. And really, because we know that that transition is challenging, that you want to over communicate and over reach out to those individuals during that period to make sure that they get into treatment and that they can establish themselves there because that is a period where frequently what we know is that um, people feel a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear around changing what has been a pattern for them so often the use is is the substance that they're using on some level is a coping mechanism and taking that away without having something to replace it to replace it with is very challenging for the individual. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, a great question. Thank you. I don't I don't see any other questions in on my end yet. So I'm just going to move along to the next slide, but please feel free to type in any, any questions. Um, we still have time for questions. So I just wanted to briefly share the quick guides that we're releasing today. Um, so we have a referral to treatment quick guide. This is part of the series. There's one on screening and brief interventions, as I mentioned on our website. Um, this one is the referral to treatment. It also goes over math. Um, it's basically like a easy to read, best practices, implementation considerations, um, has some of what Amy went over today. Um, and you all will receive this as an email uh, on Friday. So we'll send these all out to you. And then the other one that we're releasing is um, on use and opiate use disorder. Um, it just gives like a brief overview. Our first webinar that we had in this series was, was about this topic. So if you're interested in learning more specifically about the stats and the impact um, OUC has with use, you can go ahead and the recording is on our website. Um, here's Amy's contact information, which I think she also just uh, shared out. Um, so please feel free to contact her. I'm gonna pause and see if any other questions come in. Okay, well, you have Amy's email. If anything comes up, um, just a few other like housekeeping items. When you close out the webinar, um, an evaluation will automatically pop up. It's just five short multiple choice questions. If you all could answer those, it's a great help to us. Thank you so much for attending today, um, and we hope you are staying safe and healthy. Thank you.